In this video, we're going to talk about numerical integration. That is, we're going to use numerical approximation techniques to try to approximate the value of a definite integral. Sometimes you can't do it by using an antiderivative because it's either too hard or impossible to find an antiderivative. So, um, in calculus one, we learned about the numerical integral command in Sage, which does numerical approximations for definite integrals. That's not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about some various approximation techniques to give you an idea of how this numerical integral command could do its job. So the first numerical integration technique comes from the definition of the definite integral as a limit of Riemann sum. So the Riemann sum is a sort of the simplest numerical approximation for your integral. Uh, we did this in calculus one, so we'll just quickly review it again. Um, our goal is to approximate the integral from a to b of some function f. So we're going to use n rectangles. We'll assume their widths are equal. So the width of each rectangle is b minus a over n, which I'll call delta x. The height of each rectangle is given by the value of the function at some point along the base of that rectangle. Um, usually we'll choose either the left endpoint and get the left Riemann sum, or we'll choose the right endpoint for each subinterval and get the right Riemann sum, though you could choose theoretically anything in that subinterval. So the endpoints of the different rectangles, the different subintervals along the x-axis, you start at x equals a, and then you add delta x equal each time, so a plus delta x, a plus 2 delta x, and so on, until you get a plus n delta x, which is equal to b. And you've reached the upper limit. So the left Riemann sum, you're going to take this left endpoint. So in the first interval goes from a to a plus delta x. The left side is a, so you plug that into the function. That gives you your height. Delta x is the width of the rectangle, so this is the area of that first rectangle. In the second subinterval, it goes from a plus delta x to a plus 2 delta x. So the left side is this one. Plug it into the function, multiply it by delta x, and so on. Here it is in summation notation. And um, you're just taking each endpoint of the subinterval, plugging it into the function, and multiplying by delta x. And the right Riemann sum looks exactly the same, except for a little shift in index. This one starts at i equals 0. So when i equals 0, you get f of a. It stops at n minus 1. So you never quite reach b. Remember, b has n here multiplied by delta x. In the right Riemann sum, you start with i equals 1, which means you're starting with this guy, a plus delta x. And you stop when i equals n, which is b. All right. So here's an example of that. So I want to approximate this, say. And let's use five rectangles. Here's the picture of five rectangles for the left and right Riemann sum. And you can see that you know we want this space to be filled in, and it's not. We want this space to be filled in, and it's not. Um, we got some extra overestimate. This blue here we don't want. This blue here we don't want. And then the, this is the, the left sum, the right sum. Uh, we got extra blue here and no blue there. And we want blue there. We want to erase this blue. We want, got extra blue up here. We got extra blue up here. So um, we got some overestimate. We got some underestimate. And here's the animation. We saw this in calculus one. Um, the idea is to see what happens when the number of rectangles increases. So we start out with five, and I'm just going to have more and more rectangles. And the more rectangles you get, you start seeing that the extra blue down here on the bottom starts to disappear. And the, let's go ahead and do it again. The extra, uh, well, the white that should be filled in is starting to get filled in more and more and more. And our overestimate down there on the bottom, that extra blue is starting to disappear. And we're getting closer and closer to filling in the actual area under the curve that we want. So here's the formulas we use in calculus one for calculating left and right Riemann sums. You can change the function. You can change the a and b. You can change how many rectangles there are. And then everything else is just built in. It calculates it. So here's the left Riemann sum and the right Riemann sum for the example above with five rectangles. Um, and you can see it's about 0.32 and 1.12. These are not great. Okay, The exact value here is 2 thirds. If we get to 10 rectangles, uh, then you see that these get closer. They're still, don't even have one decimal place of accuracy here with 10 rectangles. But they're getting closer to 2 thirds. 
and we, we can get better and better if we increase the value of n. Especially with a computer, you could have n is a thousand or ten thousand or a million, and you could get uh, a decent approximation. But there are better techniques in this that don't require so many computations. Uh, one improvement is to use the midpoint rule. It's actually another Riemann sum, but instead of using the left or right endpoints of each subinterval, it uses the midpoint of each subinterval. So in our um, example up above, you can see that our rectangles are, you know, this one is an overestimate because we got too much. This one here is an underestimate. And, well, there is this one where it's kind of a, has some over and under. But most of them are either one or the other. And so if you use the midpoint, it kind of balances out the over and under part. Okay, some part of the rectangle is going to be above the curve and part of the rectangle will be below um, as long as the curve doesn't change direction there. So here's a plot with five rectangles for the midpoint rule. Okay, so like in this rectangle, you can see we got some overestimate, but we also have some underestimate. So if you kind of take this blue, it would almost fill in this white. You take this extra blue above the curve, you could fill in this white below the curve. Um, here, they kind of... Um, it doesn't work out that well when it crosses the axis there, but anyway, uh, this part we have a little bit of overestimate, and it doesn't quite balance there. Uh, that's because in this one is where it changes direction. Here uh, we got overestimate right there, and we got some underestimate there, so this blue kind of fill in this white. So um, midpoint doesn't work out exactly like that when there's a change of direction like happened here, but on these other ones where you are either increasing or decreasing. Your overestimate and underestimate kind of balance each other out, and you get a better answer, generally speaking. So here's what we get from the midpoint rule with five rectangles, 0.64. Remember the exact value is two-thirds, or 0.6 repeating. And for five rectangles, remember the left sum was 0.3, and the right sum was 1.1. They weren't even close. The midpoint rule actually has that 0.6. It's actually getting kind of reasonably close. So it's done a good job of balancing out the under and over estimates and giving you a, a decent answer without too many calculations. All right, the next idea is the trapezoidal rule. So far, we've been approximating our function using a constant. So in each subinterval, we just assume the function equals the function value at some particular point, either the left endpoint or the right endpoint or the midpoint. In all those cases, we're, we're using a, a rectangle which assumes the function is a constant on that subinterval. A constant gives you graphically as a horizontal line degree zero polynomial. So the idea is to increase the degree of our approximation from degree zero polynomial horizontal line to a degree one polynomial, which is a non-horizontal line. Um, and well, we hope that that will improve our approximation. We'll see what happens. So for each subinterval, we're going to use the secant line that based on the left and right endpoints. So we're just going to take the function value at the left endpoint and the function value at the right endpoint and we're going to connect those with a straight line. And you're not going to get a rectangle from this um, unless those happen to be the left and right, or the values at the left and right endpoint. If they happen to be the same, then you'll actually get a horizontal line. You'll have a rectangle. But usually you'll get a trapezoid. That's why it's called a trapezoidal rule. Now the area of a trapezoid, this is the formula we know from geometry, you take, you add together the two bases and divide by two, and then you multiply by the height. In this case, our trapezoids are actually sitting on their side, so the bases are vertical and the height is actually delta x. Uh, let's see the picture here. So to see a trapezoid, you gotta turn your head sideways, here's the height of this trapezoid, here's the first base, here's the second base, here's the slanted side, so the trapezoid is actually kind of sitting on its side. Normally we think of a trapezoid as kind of the bigger base is sitting on the ground and um, it slopes up, but this one is kind of, they're all on their side. Same thing with this guy. Um, here's one base, this is the longer base, here's the shorter base, this is the height, and there's our slanted side. Now sometimes, like here, um, you know, you get a triangle if there's a, a zero on one end. Um, it's possible to get a rectangle, but usually these are, are trapezoids. So, um, oops, here's the calculation with the trapezoidal rule. I programmed it in here. Um, you know, you just take the, there's the left endpoint, there's the right endpoint of the subinterval. You add those together, um, and 
divide by 2, there's the division by 2. I'm not sure why I put it in that order, but anyway, this is the base 1 plus base 2 divided by 2, and then multiply by delta x, that's the height. And here's what trapezoidal rule gives me, 0.72. It's a little bit disappointing because our approximation is actually worse than what we got from the midpoint rule. Now it's a lot better than the left or right sum. In fact, numerically speaking, the trapezoidal rule just gives you the average of the left and right sums. So if you take the left sum and the right sum, add them together, divide by two, you'll get the trapezoidal rule. Um, in general, not always, but generally speaking, the midpoint rule actually gives you a better approximation. If the function f is either concave up or concave down on the entire subinterval, then the linear approximation from the trapezoidal rule will either be entirely above or entirely below the curve. So if we look here um, on the positive y-axis, when the function values are positive, this is concave up, the secant lines are always above. So anytime you have concave up and you're above the x-axis, your secant lines are going to be an overestimate. Now here, when you're below the x-axis, everything's kind of reversed, so the secant lines are, are above the curve, which gives you an underestimate. But um, generally speaking, you don't have that balancing out kind of effect that you did from the midpoint rule. You're either always over or you're always under on that interval, unless the concavity changes on that subinterval, which can happen. All right, so despite that kind of disappointment that using a uh, degree one polynomial didn't really do any better than the midpoint rule, which was just a degree zero polynomial. That idea was a good idea. So if we move up to the next step, degree two polynomial, so a quadratic function or a parabola graphically, then we'll get what's called Simpson's rule, and that is a substantial improvement. So now rather than assuming the function is a straight line, either horizontal or otherwise, we're going to uh, use a curve, uh, a parabola, to approximate the function. And since most of our functions that we're going to integrate are going to be curved, not straight, uh, we would expect Simpson's rule to be an improvement. And it is a substantial improvement. Now the algebra is a little bit tedious because you have to fit a parabola to your function somehow, and it's kind of a mess, but anyway, um, part of that is because uh, you know, to get a line you only need two points, but to get a parabola you need three points. So we're going to use the um, left endpoints of three consecutive subintervals here. So you can't just use you know, left and right endpoint. That's only two. You need a third one. And rather than using the midpoint or some other thing, we're actually just going to take two subintervals, two next to each other, and we're going to take the endpoints, you know, the left side, and then the, the one they share, where they touch, and then the, the right of the second one. And that will give us our three points to determine the parabola. Now that means the number of parabolas is not equal to the number uh, to this n that you have, you know, the number of subintervals. You actually only get n divided by two parabolas because you get one parabola for uh, two subintervals. And so that means n has to be even for this to work out. Now the textbook, if you want to look in the book um, on those pages, unless the version of the the edition of the book has changed since I recorded this, then, well, then the pages might be wrong. Anyway, it's in the book on, you can find it about Simpson's rule. And it's complicated algebra, but it actually simplifies to a, a reasonable thing. Uh, so the integral is approximately equal to, this is the formula for Simpson's rule. You have delta x, the width of each subinterval, divided by three. You got the function value at a, remember a is the, the lower limit, that's the left side of your picture. And then you have a plus delta x is the the next endpoint for the next subinterval, um, you plug that into the function and you multiply it by four. And then you take the, the next endpoint and you plug it into the function and you multiply it by two. And then you take the next endpoint, plug it in the function, multiply it by four, and then two again. And it goes back and forth, two to four, two to four, two to four, until finally you get to the very end um, where you have b, and you plug that in, that's the right side, the upper limit of integration, you plug that into the function and you just multiply by one. There's no four or two there. So you get this pattern of coefficients here on these function values. One for f of a, then four, two, four, two, four, two, four, two, keeps alternating back and forth, four, two, four, two, four, two, until you get one at the end. So um, I won't take you through the algebra that shows this, but it has a relatively reasonable pattern you can follow 
in terms of actual computation. So here's an example, uh, same function we've been dealing with. I'm going to use n equals 10 subintervals, which will give us five parabolas. So remember 10 divided by two. Um, there's the function, there's the left and right limit, here's the number of subintervals, which is, again, twice the number of parabolas. So I, this uh, gets the coefficient. So I take this 4, 2, and um, uh, copy it a bunch of times, and then I add a 1 to the beginning and to the ending, and actually, I think I might have made a, did I make a mistake up here? I don't know, I'll check this. Anyway, um, it, oh, I see, there's, never mind. So, uh, don't have to worry about programming this, okay? I programmed it for you. The point is not how do you program this in the computer, I did that. The point is just look at what results come out and see how good they are. That's what your goal is here. Okay, so uh, here's the answer. Remember, the answer, the exact answer for this integral is two-thirds, and we got two-thirds. There's a little round in here, but anyway, it looks like two-thirds. Now, of course, this example, we're using a parabola. So if you start with a parabola, Simpson's rule gives you the exact answer every time because, of course, the best fit for that parabola is itself. So you're getting the exact answer here. Um, it's interesting to note, in terms of just numerical calculations, Simpson's rule actually gives you a weighted average for, of the answers from the trapezoid rule and the midpoint rule with half the number of rectangles. So if we let s of 2n is the uh, Simpson's rule with 2n subintervals, so that means you're using n parabolas. If tn is the approximation with n trapezoids and mn is the approximation from the midpoint rule with uh, n rectangles, then this Simpson's rule, what you get from n parabolas is you take the trapezoid rule f with n rectangles, n, I mean, sorry, n trapezoids, just weight 1. You take the midpoint rule with weight 2, add those together, divide by 3. So this is a weighted average which weights the midpoint rule as twice the weight of the trapezoid rule, which kind of makes sense. We saw before that the midpoint rule, generally speaking, was better than the trapezoidal rule, but the trapezoidal rule does have a valuable contribution. So if you take, you know, two-thirds of the midpoint rule and one-third of the trapezoid rule, that actually gives you the same answer as having Simpson's rule with um, n parabolas, twice the number of subintervals. So that's kind of curious. Okay, let me do one last example. Um, I didn't, and by the way, I skipped over graphs of Simpson's rule. I'll come back to that at the end. But first, I want to go ahead and just do one example. It puts all the pieces together. I would suggest you use this example, the copy and paste, for your assignment. Your assignment might not la ask for all of them. So here I have left and right Riemann sums, midpoint, trapezoid, and Simpson's rule. And if I don't ask for all of them, you can just delete the pieces that you don't need. So I kind of marked them here. Uh, so you can easily delete stuff that you don't need. But you can change the function. You can change the limits of integration. So A is the one on the bottom. B is the one on the top. Um, the number of rectangles I will specify in the problem on your assignment. So in this one, I'm trying to approximate this, uh, the integral of the uh, degree 5 polynomial. I'm going to use three different sizes of, of n here, number of subintervals, and see what happens. And just see how good of approximations we get. Okay, now we, it's not that bad uh, to do this integral. I mean, this is one you can find the antiderivative of. It's just a polynomial. So here's the exact value of that integral, 616.5. And left Riemann sum with, uh, how many did I start with? 10, 10 rectangles. So 479, 773. So we don't even have the right number of hundreds here with the left right, and right Riemann sums. And the midpoint rule, 611.8. So it's about 612. The right answer is about 617. So uh, pretty close. We got the 600 and we got the teens. We just a little bit too low. Trapezoid rule, also in the ballpark, 626. Uh, not too bad. Not as close as the midpoint rule, but not too bad. And then look here at Simpson's rule. We got 616.5, and then we have this extra 405. So Simpson's rule is off by that uh, 405 out of, what is that? 405 out of 10,000, uh, which is 
is pretty good for only 10 subintervals, and that's only five parabolas. All right, here's 50 subintervals, so we got 50 rectangles. Here's my exact value. Um, the left and right Riemann sums, at least if we round, to, they would round to 600. And okay, so we're kind of getting closer. Uh, the midpoint rule is quite close. Trapezoid rule also pretty good. We just a little bit off in the first decimal place here. And Simpson's rule 616.5, and then little six extra 648 out here. Um, very little error. And here is a hundred rectangles, and the left and right Riemann sum still we got 600, but we don't even have the 10 yet. Here is 602. Here is 631. Um, the midpoint rule, at least if you round to the nearest tenth, it would be correct. This one, if you round to the nearest tenth, it would actually round up to 616.6, .6, but pretty close. And then again, Simpson's rule, even better, um, even less error here. So what we see in all these examples is that all the approximations get better as you increase the number of subintervals. That's not surprising. The left and right Riemann sums are generally not very good approximations unless you make n very, very large. The midpoint rule and trapezoid rule are better than either the left and right sum. Generally, the midpoint rule is better than the trapezoidal rule, and they can give you decent approximations even, even with a relatively small number of rectangles. But Simpson's rule is by far the best and doesn't require that many subintervals to get a good answer. And when you in your assignment, you're going to see this same things borne out. Lastly, I just wanted to show you a, a graph of Simpson's rule. So I'm going to try to integrate the cosine function, um, which is in black. These red lines mark the ends of the parabola. So the first parabola goes in blue from here to here, and then a parabola goes from here to here, a third parabola there, fourth parabola there, and the fifth parabola there. Okay, so we got five parabolas, 10 subintervals. And you can see that you know, this is going to be better than a Riemann sum. Um, at least, you know, the cosine in black is curved, and so the parabola is curved, but it's not a perfect fit. So here the parabola in blue doesn't quite go down far enough, leaves some empty space there and there. Here, the, you know, the cosine kind of bends more, the parabola is kind of straighter there, but better than Riemann sum. Here's 20 subintervals, gives you 10 parabolas, and with that, um, and here's our first parabola. We can't even tell the difference on this window. Now, of course, if you zoomed in, you would see these are not exactly the same. But it doesn't take a whole lot of parabolas to match this cosine function. And you know, cosine function is not at all straight, waving back and forth like here. So uh, Simpson's rule doing a good job.